All right. Um, thank you all for being here and welcome to our uh, session, our symposium, Sustaining Ecological Research in Venezuela. We really appreciate you all being here. And um, I would like to start by quickly acknowledging and thank, uh, giving a big thank to the ATVC for their support, for giving us, for being open to our organizing this session and for their support to our Venezuelan colleagues and, and, and students in particular. Um, I will quickly start sharing my, uh, my screen uh, for a quick introduction, but let me quickly uh, do a quick housekeeping. Uh, I would like to remind you that to any, any questions you may have, uh, please use the Q and A's uh, function on the on the bottom of your screen on the Zoom. Um, if there is any question uh, specifically related uh, directly to uh, one of the panelists and uh, or let, let me know or let me know um, the name of the people that you would like to uh, uh, answer that question. Also, um, we, if there is not enough time for, for, uh, for answering all the question in this hour, there is opportunity to co continue this conversation in uh, Using the platform in WOVA, so you can op we can open any any community uh, questions and and we can chat over uh, over there. Okay, um, I'm gonna quickly start sharing this um, this few slides. Can I have a thumbs up if everybody's seeing okay the my my screen? All right. Um, so um, thank you again for being here. We'll, uh, we wanted to uh, organize, take the opportunity for the ATVC meeting uh, to discuss a few of the most important uh, long-term research projects that has been happening in Venezuela. And what I say most important is because these are the ones that, that we know are ongoing, but uh, there is a lot of other research that is ongoing in, uh, that uh, deserve to be highlighted in, in, a, in such an event. I don't want to spend too much time, but basically I just want to highlight that the location, geographic location of Venezuela confers a, um, the conditions for a high diverse country in many ways, not only in terms of biodiversity, species diversity, but in ecosystem and people. Um, and for a long time, uh, many, Many institutions, research institutions, have been uh, sustaining um, either in situ or ex situ efforts to to do research and conserve and preserve natural resources in Venezuela. Um, that and that have been opening uh, opportunities for conducting research uh, um, in the last 50, 60 years. And an important part of this, of the reason why we chose ATVC to, to present this symposium is that Venezuela was, uh, used to be a, a very active member of the ATVC, uh, thanks to Emilio Bruna, uh, current president of ATVC, that gently shared this, this bulletin from the 1962 Neotropical Botany Conference. We, we knew that Venezuela was a part of the foundation of the ATVC, but uh, for for, and for many years was an active member of ATVC. But I don't wanna use this space to basically to rant or vent about the ongoing Venezuelan crisis, but it's, it's important to highlight that in the last 10 to 20, especially in the last 10 to five years, the crisis, the geopolitical economic crisis has taken a big toll on research and especially in the, in the efforts of con con continuing and maintaining long-term research. And so we were, one of our goals or several of our goals in this symposium was to discuss a few results about the state of long-term ecological research in Venezuela, highlighting how global change is affecting a uh, unique ecosystem across Venezuela, and maybe have the opportunity to uh, start reaching out to the ATVC to see how ATVC can collaborate with the Venezuela and how Venezuelan scientists, whether outside or inside Venezuela, can uh, help the ATVC community and the overall 
research community interested in the tropics to answer regional and global questions. So for that, we have really nice, four nice, really uh, important uh, presentations. Uh, first of all, we will have uh, Luis Daniel Jambi from Universidad de los Andes. He's gonna talk, uh, talk us about the dynamics of the uh, last glacier of the Venezuelan Andes and how the, what are the implications in terms of global change. They will have Douglas Rodriguez who will uh, highlight some of the, his work in, in coastal rivers and their commu fish communities. Eulogio will follow with, uh, uh, will take us back again to the Andes uh, now with a retrospect retrospective and uh, uh, analysis of the impact of global change and the special dynamics of Venezuela in, in the high Andes. And then uh, Cristabel will summarize more than four decades of monitoring uh, forests in, 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 in Venezuela. Hopefully we have enough time to, after the, the presentation to answer questions uh, you may have. So I will stop sharing my screen and I will ask uh, Patricia to uh, start the presentations. Thank you. Hello, my name is Luis Daniel Jambi. Uh, I am professor at Universidad de los Andes in Merida, Venezuela, and uh, currently coordinating the Adaptation at Altitude program uh, at Condesa. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, synchronic and monitoring approaches for understanding climate change impacts uh, in the Venezuelan high Andes. So first, the scenario, the tropical Andes, this is the largest and most populated region in the in tropical alpine, alpine ecosystems of the world. It's also the number one hotspot for plants with outstanding levels of endemism. Uh, and it comprises uh, more than 95% of all the uh, glaciers uh, located in the tropics around the world. Um, climate change is having a very uh, strong impact in this region. Uh, you can see an increase in uh, 0 0.4 uh, degrees Celsius per decade in the last 30 years in the northern Andes, associated with a decrease in uh, more than 10% in precipitation. And you can see here uh, data uh, in the bottom uh, of the slide of, uh, from Merida Airport of temperature records and precipitation records from the 1960s to, to 2010. And as you can see, it's very evident it's an increase in temperature and a decrease in precipitation during this period, uh, which creates a lot of uncertainty in terms of the long-term effects on biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. One of the most evident uh, manifestations of, of climate change in the region is, is glacier retreat. Uh, this, uh, in the tropical Andes, glaciers are in fact retreating faster than the global average. You can see here the annual mass balance uh, of, of, of glaciers, and you can see that the line for the tropical Andes is below uh, the average line for several glaciers, is below the global average. So a faster uh, decline in glaciers in the tropical Andes than the global average. Uh, this means, in the case of Venezuela, uh, uh, that it will soon become the first post-glacial uh, nation uh, in the Andes, and probably one of the first in the world, if not, if not the first. And uh, just to show a, 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 an example, here is the last Venezuelan glacier at Humboldt Peak. And you can see a picture from 1910 uh, taken for, by Alfredo Jam, and the same panoramic from 2019. And you can see a dramatic uh, retreat of the glacier at Humboldt Peak. So the, all of this, uh, moreover, coincides with probably the worst uh, crisis for scientific research in, in Venezuelan histories and for Venezuelan universities. Uh, this is threatening uh, um, uh, an ecological research tradition that had more than 60 years uh, in the Venezuelan Andes and uh, highlights the urgent need to sustain long-term monitoring efforts to, to be able to understand and to continue to study uh, climate change impacts in this uh, vulnerable region. So what I'm going to show you is examples of, of diachronic and synchronic approaches that we have been using in the Venezuelan Andes to, to analyze climate change. In terms of diachronic monitoring, I'm going to show you permanent plot uh, information from the Gloria Andes re, uh, network. Uh, which uh, works in, uh, along the Andes uh, using a permanent plot approach. And on the other hand, I'm going to show you synchronic data from chrono sequence studies that we have been implementing in the forefield of the Humboldt Glacier, uh, 
uh, within the framework of a, of a project financed by the National Geographic Society. So for the Gloria Andes Network, uh, we can say that this is one of the strongest South-South cooperation uh, long-term monitoring networks in South America. It was established in 2010. It involves more than 40 researchers, 16 different institutions along the Andes, 19 sites and 74 monitoring summits along these 7,000 kilometers of the Andes, uh, with more than 1,000 species that are being monitored. In Venezuela, we have two sites, seven summits uh, in the Cordillera de Merida, uh, in, the, in the west, in La Culata Sierra, one site, and in the east, in the Sierra Nevada, uh, one site with four summits uh, between uh, 3,800 and 4,600 meters, uh, these seven summits. We established the baseline in 2012, and we have been doing resampling. Uh, the last resampling we did was in 2019. So about five years of uh, monitoring in each of these sites uh, that have been, we have been recording changes in temperature and vegetation. So this is an example of one of the permanent plots uh, of clusters of, of one, one by one meter plots in, a, in the 4,400 meter summit. Uh, and we are comparing here, for example, a picture from 2012 and 2017. And what you can see, is a species richness has increased to more species in, uh, in 2017. The cover of plants, total plant cover has also increased to 73%. And you see also uh, the appearance of a lot of uh, new species, uh, particularly small herbs that are colonizing these, these small permanent plants. When you look at it uh, at a more general uh, level, uh, comparing the 4,200, the 4,400, and the 4,600 meter uh, summits, what you see is an increase in the number of species in all of these summits, uh, between nine and 11 new species that we are recording uh, in these areas compared to 2012. So an increase in richness, which is probably related with this colonization of small herbs coming from lower elevations, uh, probably linked with the climate change impacts. On the other hand, the uh, asynchronic approach uh, has been used uh, in this uh, last Venezuelan glacier project uh, to study primary succession in the forefield of Humboldt Glacier. Uh, and what we did is to, is to do a process of reconstruction and mapping of glacier retreat using all panoramic pictures, uh, uh, satellite images, uh, aerial photographs, etc analyzed soil development uh, along the chrono sequence, uh, vegetation dynamics, comparing the composition and abundance of lichens, mosses, and vascular plants, and looked also at species interactions and the role of positive interactions in, in the assembly of these new ecosystems uh, in these extreme uh, elevations and conditions. So you see here um, uh, the reconstruction of glacier retreat for La Concha, Bolivar, and Humboldt Peak. Uh, and what you can see comparing the, the purple, which is 1910, to the red, which is 2019, is a, is a very fast retreat of glaciers. The only patch remaining is the one in red at Humboldt Peak. In terms of, uh, of, of the loss of area, you can see that the total for the Sierra Nevada it, it has gone for 500 hectares, uh, more or less. Uh, to less than 4.5 uh, hectares in, in 2019, which represents a, a loss of 99% of glacier area. So as I said, we used a chrono sequence approach to study uh, the vegetation dynamics along these four transects established from the position of the glacier in 1910 to the position of the glacier in uh, 2009. And uh, what you can see is that during these more than 100 years, uh, Soil organic matter has increased, but very, very slowly from 0.5% uh, 10 years after glacial retreat to not more than 1.7% uh, 109 years later. So very slow buildup of soil organic matter, very slow dynamics of vegetation as well. You see here the change from 10 years to uh, 109 years dominated initially by lichens uh, and very little plant colonization. As, and as time progresses, you can see that the green uh, bar, which represents uh, vascular plants, slowly progresses and increases until you reach about 30% uh, of soil cover uh, by plants uh, after 100 years. So very slow vegetation de de development and the potential loss of, of high elevation and early successional species uh, that are probably won't be able to cope with the very fast pace of, of climate change. So in conclusion, we see evidence of very fast climate change in the tropical Andes and uh, 
in, in Venezuela, this, this means that it will be soon the fir first post-glacial nation in the Andes uh, with 99% loss of, of glacial cover in the last 100 years. This is happening amongst uh, the worst crisis for scientific research in the history of Venezuela, and this poses challenges for maintaining long-term monitoring. Uh, we saw that uh, the increase in temperatures observed has, is probably uh, related with an increase in species richness in these long-term monitoring summits, although we have uh, data only for the first five years. A uh, very slow response uh, of vegetation and soils in the case of glacial forefields fields in these very extreme areas. You have the development of novel ecosystems with very few species and the accumulation of a, of a possible accumulation of a climat climatic depth as vegetation is not able to keep up with the fast pace of climate change. And uh, finally, an urgent need to devise collaboration strategies to sustain long-term research in one of the best studied high mountain regions in the tropics. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Douglas Rodriguez Solarte. I'm a professor at the Universidad Centro Occidental in Santo Alvarado in Venezuela. We work with rivers and fish, biogeography and conservation. Continuing with this symposium, we will talk about the stressors that determine the loss of coastal rivers and their fish in Venezuela. The combination of stressors associated with the human frontier and the global change have a significant impact on rivers, their biodiversity and ecosystem service. Today, there is increasing evidence indicating rivers are the most threatened ecosystems. If we can determine the spatial and temporal variation of these environmental gradients and disturbance, we will also be able to suggest router for to conservation. The main stressor that determine the conservation status of the rivers are deforestation, water extraction, fragmentation of channel, urban effluents without treatment, mining, including oil, gold, gravel, and sand, global change, and climatic emergency, entre others. In Venezuela, the situation is difficult because there are few studies and programs dedicated to rivers biomonitoring and the current crisis line limits the continuity of the work of researchers and environmental managers. The lack of information influences the adequate protection of hydrobiological resources and limits the strategies of the restoration of habitat and population, as well as the possible alternatives to face climate change. To generate information that can be used to resolve this situation, the regional fish collection developed a biomonitoring program for coastal rivers and their fishes. Here, I will present some aspects of the research effort on the biomonitoring of coastal rivers in Venezuela. Specifically, I will comment on the feeding in the relationships detected between the attributes of rivers, habitat, and their ichthyofauna with respect to environmental and human stressors at different scales. We are sampling and generating records since the beginning of this century in Piedmont and mountain streams and in coastal drainage of Venezuela. These coastal rivers are home to about 100 species of freshwater fish and around 20% of endemic species. The coastal drainages are home to larger cities and industries and is perhaps the most impacted region in Venezuela. Most of these rivers are polluted, but there are many well-preserved tributaries in the mountains. The records included the characterization of the drainages with remote sensing to estimate change in the most important land uses. 
the main stressor or river ecosystem are also identified, such as the presence, location, and extension of riparian forests, crops, pasture, and urban areas. In areas of strains, we measure water variables, substrated heterogeneity, and riparian zones. We use standardized electrofission to determine the distribution and abundance of species along each river. With biological data, we relate geographic and environmental variables and land uses, including anthropogenic stressors at different scale and times. The landscape matrix for each drainage was dominated by primary forests in mountains, usually protected areas. But the deforestation, agriculture, and urban centers were common. We have found rivers with a high species weakness and endemism, some restricted to very small drainages. In addition, larger and wetter drainages showed a higher proportion of primary species or salt intolerant species than smaller and drier drainages. We recognize several impacts on the rivers and these had spatial and temporal chains. Along the river conservation gradient, we found the mass on them are under at least one fold on degradation produced by human stressor from agroindustrial wastewater and sedimentation, for example, and from sand and mines or to dams. Extraordinary dragouts have fragmented several tributaries, but later many were colonized by tolerant fish that formed simplified communities. This is a predictive warning about to the future. The elimination of the forest and the expansion of the urban frontier have spread rapidly throughout the region during this century and clearly explain the loss of river habitat, heterogeneity, and fish diversity. The same is true for other important stressors, and today various endemic and intolerant species are not recorded in disturbed environments. There are protected areas with rivers with good condition and where we designate baseline reference location for biomonitoring, that is, rivers with the best possible conditions. These reference sites have served to compare the past condition of the rivers with actual situation. On a small scale, most of fluvial habitat and their faunas are at the risk. Some rivers were too degraded and have lost species. In a regional scale, an index of drainage conservation status show. Most drainages have a very few cover of forest. Most of the very small drainages with good conservation status are in protected areas. Current situation and implication. Human stressor in combination with the global change are producing the collapses and elimination of coastal rivers and their fish. The prognosis is worse. Long-term rivers monitoring servers to understand variation and trends in the responses of ecosystems and their fauna to the impact of human stressor and change at large spatial and temporal scales. However, several projects and paralyzed because there are no human and material resources for the research. The gaps between the generation, the generation of information and the action for conservation is widening. We are losing the race to generate information while the impacts advance faster than our capacity to respond. We can we do? We must continue with biomonitoring and research 
with reference localities in order to have adequate data and information, but standardized, standardized and accessible. We need to create collaboration networks and alliances to continue and consolidate river biomonitoring in the long term, mining in co-research and co-financing of specific objectives and resources, grants for studies and development of the graduate work, and grants for information dissemination and citizen science. Thanks for your attention. Hello and welcome to this talk, Impact of Global Change on Spatial Dynamic in Venezuela, Los Andes Ecoregion Case, into the Sustained Long-Term Ecological Research in Venezuela, Opportunities and Challenges at Symposium, uh, which is a part of the virtual meeting of the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation. I am Eulogio Chacón Moreno from University of Lleida Department of Crop and Forestry Science and also the Institute of Environmental and Ecological Science, ICAE Venezuela. Uh, we're talking about today about four uh, things, uh, but mainly uh, try to explain what are we doing uh, during the last 20 years in research in landscape ecology with an example of, uh, of Andes and monitoring the uh, tree line and special uh, uh, paramo forest uh, moving upwards. Uh, we know that global change, uh, global, the, the air uh, have been changed during the 4,600 million of years with extinction and life evolution. However, uh, the humanity and the, the main and the woman also uh, accelerated the process of change and, and now we have a global change but is a lot of, of driver ag agents that cause uh, change in the uh, uh, global and, and regional uh, uh, space and we will uh, focus especially today in two of these in relation to the Andes, which is climate warming and uh, alteration of precipitation and land transformation. And how uh, we can identify some indicator of change and then how can uh, make a monitoring process, uh, especially for the last part of this meeting. Then the question is how this agent of change impact the spatial dynamic of, of the tree line in Venezuela, in Los Andes. And what is the tree line? Is this area between uh, forest and paramo, special, specifically where the ecotone of paramo forest occur around 3000 meters. And the study that we uh, uh, present in this uh, speech is uh, based on landscape and ecology approach using multi-temporal studies of the last five decades uh, to determine the transformation of the tree lines and movement of the tree line in the Cordillera de Mérida, Venezuela. In the Cordillera de Mérida, we have three areas to study. One is the Capaz area. The second is the Na uh, Sierra Nevada National Park, a small area. And the third area, is the uh, Alto Chama Basin, High Alto Chama Basin, uh, where we uh, carry out different uh, studies in the CAPAS, uh, focus on transitional ecosystem map and vertical ecosystem rate displacement. And on Sierra Nevada uh, National Park, the study of vegetation map with detail on the structure of the vegetation and metrics of chains. In Alto Chama, we compare ecosystem map to ecosystem of potential uh, uh, potential map. Is uh, in the case of, of Capaz study, we obtain five maps corresponding with four periods of a study, where identifying four special or, or, or main ecosystem paramo forest, which is the uh, ecotone crops, forest, and paramo. 
and we calculate and estimate a lot of uh, uh, transformation rates of chains uh, from different uh, uh, states and create a model of uh, states and transitions. Especially, we can see how Paramo is uh, is uh, going on uh, or is transforming in, in, in a forest through uh, Paramo forest. And we see that the, the main transformation and uh, the, the, the black uh, arrows uh, indicates the main transformation during these 57 years with an area of uh, 12 hectare per year. However, we concentrate in how it's changing in, in the vertical uh, uh, dimension um, and also uh, estimate how uh, can move uh, outwards. And we understand and we found different uh, estimation but uh, if, if we consider uh, vertical displacement that derived only from Paramo ecosystem is around 22 meters per decade, per every 100 meters of horizontal distance. At the end, when, when we uh, make uh, average, uh, the vertical displacement is around 22 meters per decade, per every 100 meters of horizontal distance. And what we did in Sierra Nevada National Park was compare only to today, 1952 and 1998, uh, comparing the structure of vegetation and we obtained uh, a table with, uh, the, with, for the major ecosystem with this Paramo, Paramo forest and a mountain forest we find vegetation types. And in Alto Chama study cast, we, we made a map of ecosystem from 2018. Uh, and, and from this map, we calculate a, a potential map and study how it's changed from nothing or from no use to use and, uh, and found that most of the uh, Paramo forest disappear uh, for use of agriculture. Now, in relation specific with Paramo forest and climate change, we see uh, in climate that more or less, uh, considering in different uh, uh, date, uh, the the weather is changing in around for many airport airport in is higher is 0 0.18 degrees per decade and for the Venezuela is around 0 0.06 uh, degrees uh, per decade. Considering this uh, aspect and how it's moving, at the end we found that if we consider only the whole forest ecosystem vertical displacement that is 14 meters per decade, the rate of forest migration is lower than the potential warming. And this rate is really realistic because it includes the successional process of forest ecosystem. And this it means that uh, the forest is, uh, is going slowly related to what the potential change correspond with the climate change. And this is an image of how it could be changed and moving. And this is uh, the structure of how can uh, upwards uh, the, the forest to climb to the Paramo system. Well, finally, uh, to understand this global, to create a frame, we have to understand uh, how is the relation between the, all the factor or all the agents of, uh, of uh, and the interrelation between uh, possible strategies for uh, understand very well what is happening. Then using this, using this frame, uh, the real question is now how to implement a monitoring program 
uh, in order to create a strategies to adaptation, biodiversity conservation. And we, we think that it's important considering different criteria like different levels, indicator, real budget, but this is very important now in the condition of our country, national and regional support, decentralization, and also uh, uh, in here, in, uh, be more deep in research, capacity building and management. And this is what I uh, thinking that we can talk about now we come back to the beginning of the symposium. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoy this presentation. And salvemos el mundo, salvemos la tierra, es el único planeta con cerveza. Gracias. Good day, everyone. I am Cristabel Duran, and I am part of a network of colleagues to monitor the tropical forests in Venezuela. The title of our presentation is More than 40 Cats Monitoring the Structure and Function of Venezuelan Tropical Forest. First, we want to see how the forest dynamic has been during the last years at a wider geographical range. In the Amazon, turnover rates are usually higher in soils with high fertility than in Western and Central Amazonia with poorer soils. Positive trends observed in turnover rates between 1966 and 2001 in the Amazon were largely dominated by the twofold difference of requirement of a mortality. This resulted in an overall carbon sink. Recent assessments made by Amazon showed an increase in the amount of dead biomass. The reason is the intensification of severe drought that might have affected large trees and produced changes in the space and composition. Because the general trends for the Amazon forest could be different to local trends, we ask for North and South American forests if requirement, mortality, stand dynamics, apocon, biomass, and productivity have changed over recent decades. This investigation was based on similar studies undertaken in the tropics with the idea of filling a geographical gap in the North and South America and bringing additional sites to the picture, including plot forests in the Andes. We used da data from 62 permanent plots, which were established by the team of Jean-Pierre Bellon, who was working at the Universidad de los Andes in Merida, Venezuela. And those plots were established mostly in mature forests based on the distribution of light zones in the country. Those plots are the longest running monitoring plots in Latin America. With the time, different groups added more sites. On this map, we see the main location of the study sites. Climate diagrams show different temperature and precipitation regimes. Plots also cover a soil fertility gradient going from a higher fertility in the western portion of the country near the Andes compared to the older and more developed acidic soils of the Guayana Shield. So we applied a relatively simple demographic approach based on the data available. We measure for time intervals from three to four years the growth of all individuals surviving, recorded the number of new individuals in the growth, and finally we registered the number of trees that died during this interval. At the end of the interval, biomass good productivity and net above ground biomass change was estimated. We used three major groups of data. First, the environmental data, 
second estimates of two Nova grades, and third stand development descriptor and competitions. The data was analyzed with principal component analysis, generalized square regressions, and generalized linear mixed model. So our results. On the right, we see the trends in mean annual temperature for the study period. The mean annual temperature increased significantly on all the study regions. Here we have a PCA graph with two axes that explain more than 90% of the environmental variability in the dataset. The first axis captured approximately 60% of the variation and resumed a trend of decreasing moisture supply. So, toward the high levels of available water, we found the Guayana Shield region and the central Amazon plots, and in the other extreme, the more dry forests of the coast. Second axis describes about 30% of the variation and is mostly associated with increasing temperatures. Here, we see the clustering of the high elevation plots in the Andes, in the lower side of the temperature gradient, with some of the seasonal forests of the western plains to the other side. What are the patterns of tree turnover across regions? In this graph, we have the y-axis the mortality rates, and in the x-axis the requirement rate. Turnover rates were significantly different among regions. In this bivalent graph, we have more mortality than requirement, especially in the Western Plain region. With the lowland forests in Western Alluvial Plains being the most dynamic, and Guayana Shield Forest, followed by high elevation forests in the Andes, showing the lowest turnover rates. And what are the patterns of tree mortality across regions and time? This figure shows the temporal trend for mortality rates. Significant increasing trends, trends are clear through time. Here the plots are grouped by region and they show positive trends in mortality rates. Significant in all cases. The regional difference also shows that mortality slope were higher in the western portion of the country than the eastern part. Regardless of elevation or soil fertility class, mortality increase, increased significantly. And what about the patterns of requirements? As for mortality, this figure shows significantly increasing trends of requirements over time. And the requirement rates were more balanced than mortality. Their increase in the west and decline in the east. And finally, how and what are the long-term patterns of productivity in carbon? The steady positive trend in productivity is close to the value obtained for the entire Amazon. On a regional level, Productivity declined in the low mid elevation range, a region of the Andes, the Guayana Shield, and in the coast dry forest as well, while remained relatively stable or increased for high elevation forests in the Andes and in the Western Plains, respectively. This trend was accompanied also by a significant increase of similar magnitude in above ground biomass loss from mortality, but the rate at which biomass loss has increased in Venezuela forest is slightly lower than the numbers found for the entire Amazon. Importantly, these trends include a significant increase in above ground biomass loss in forests outside the Amazon, in areas like the Western Plain and the Andes which indicates a concerted and widespread phenomenon 
of higher mortality than might alter the dynamics of carbon in tropical forests. While mortality increases, the magnitude still seems to be not strong enough to significantly reduce the zinc effect as found by breeding and others in the Amazon. I come now to the end of the presentation and I want to highlight three take-home messages. We found significant difference in dynamic structure and function between different tropical forests in Venezuela. Also, we found significant change in forest dynamic in most sites in the last three decades. Especially important for increasing rates for tree mortality, mostly caused by the higher temperatures. The data from long-term plots are crucial to better understanding how tropical forests might change in the future. The plot networks are a very important resource to extend the forest, forest research and collaboration. Last but not least, because it is very important to continue to the, the monitoring of ecosystem, we need, in collaboration with colleagues abroad, to create strategies to counteract the risk of losing of our permanent plots. It is well known that difficult, uh, the difficult, uh, difficult political, economical and social situation that Venezuela is facing, and the science is not excluded from it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you uh, to all the speakers and the presentations. Um, we have uh, about 10 minutes to uh, for questions, so if people in the audience uh, want to uh, ask some question, please uh, uh, go, go for it. I have one question uh, directed to Luis uh, about the glacier. Um, is there any estimate of how long would it take to completely disappear the, the Humboldt Glacier in Merida? Uh, the, as, as you saw in the data, the, there were four hectares left uh, out of uh, more than 200 uh, at the beginning of the century, so it's it's eminent. It, it could you know it could be and uh, what I saw from from this year in January, which is you know normally the dry part of the year is when you have a faster retreat, is that there were less than two hectares from the four hectares that we saw in 2019. So yeah, it's it's going out, it's going away very very fast. I think in the next three to four years, probably it will be completely gone. But it's very difficult to estimate because it's in a very protected area, the, the last part. Great, uh, I have another question here for you, Luis. Um, from Adrian Gonzalez, he said, I understand the species are slowly colonizing higher altitudes, but are, are all species equally moving upward and which functional traits are more likely to be in loss, of being lost? Yes, that's a very good question. In uh, There are two different scenarios. One is the, the one that I showed in lower summits that we are uh, doing long-term monitoring. And what you see there is that the, the, the species that are colonizing and mainly small herbs, we were very surprised to see so much dynamics uh, in, the, you know, in the last 10 years because paramo vegetation is very long-lived. So you would assume that a lot of the species, once they are in a plot, they can stay there for very long. But what we see is that there is a lot of turnover of, of very small herb species. And, uh, and, and you see an increase in richness in the last uh, five years, which is mainly related to colonization of, of small herbs. Whereas in the case of the retreating glacier, uh, what you see, uh, it's, a, it's an increase in general in functional diversity. You start only with grasses, which are very stress tolerant to low temperatures and, and low water availability. And slowly what we see is an increase in the diversity of functional types of plants. So you see the colonization of uh, shrubs, uh, small uh, rosettes, uh, the large stem rosettes uh, over time. Uh, and probably this will mean that you will lose some of the 
early successional specialist species. Thank you, Luis. Um, connected to your talk, and I'm gonna shift to Elogio because they're in the same, sort of the same biome in the Andes. Uh, what do you think is, uh, I know you show this framework to continue monitoring in the, in the you know, research. How do you think we can move forward to continue this monitoring and, and see if we can keep going with this uh, research? This is for Eulogio. Um, this is for me. Okay. <laughs> well, this is difficult. Uh, I think uh, one of the strategies that uh, we use in the in our institute with Luis Daniel and the other colleagues was starting a, 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 a strong campaign to look for foundation around the world. And not only and the normal scientific uh, support that we can find in different ways, uh, but also like a National Geographic Foundation that uh, it was a very nice uh, opportunity to, to make this kind of, of research. This is one thing, but uh, we have also many problems, not only this, this kind of, uh, of looking for support, we have also a problems for security in the university and the infrastructure. Uh, but we have to search. But this is important to remark that uh, this take up time. We need a people looking for that. We need a people uh, using time uh, for looking for this, this kind of, of research. We don't have this platform of this uh, support in Venezuela, like in another universities around the world when you find uh, a, a special section into the university to find this kind of resource. We have to, to look for that. And this take a time and we have to consider this in our uh, planning and, and and research. Thank you. Uh, here's another question for you, Olojo. Um, I heard uh, I heard that in the Paramo regions, people have increased the use of wood for cooking due to the lack of gas supply. Would there be a chance for design sort of forest Paramos forest management strategies along with the Parameros to help increase forests in the region? Uh, we have to see that th there is uh, two places. One is when you look at the natural uh, condition, the pristine ecosystem without uh, use. And we see that uh, the Paramo forest, uh, we, we call uh, Bosque Paramero or, or Bosque Preparamero or Chirivital in, in, in Colombian language, <laughs> uh, is, uh, is, is going up. Uh, and the, 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 the way to uh, go on the Paramo is uh, very different. And it's uh, something uh, of we have uh, to study with uh, Luis Daniel and other colleagues. And on the other hand, we have uh, the problem when uh, we saw uh, what's happened in the areas uh, where now is agricultural lands like uh, all the Alto Chama uh, place uh, uh, for farming, uh, for local farming. And we studied that the, the, at the beginning of maybe before the Spanish uh, occur, uh, occupants in, in Venezuela, uh, the Paramo was mainly in these uh, dry areas were uh, Paramo forests. Now. Right, we have, we have been told that we have four more minutes before the session is closed. Uh, I would like to ask Douglas, um, what is the current, the current situation of the fish collections uh, that you're uh, handling and, and that you're working with? Bueno, te voy a, voy a decirlo en español y por favor muy rápido para que me traduzca. La situación es que las principales colecciones biológicas del país, de peces también, las botánicas, 
están en situación de riesgo porque no hay recursos fundamentales para su mantenimiento, ya sea desde el punto de vista de la consecución de materiales básicos como es el formol, el, el equipo, así como también de los especialistas que manejan las colecciones y también de estudiantes que se incorporan a las líneas de investigación taxonómicas y, y, y de investigación. Eso es una crisis que, se está, eh, que está latente y esperemos que en el, en el futuro previo, eh, pre, que viene rápidamente eh, se, se solucione moderadamente porque no se puede desatender la ciencia en ningún país independientemente del gobierno que tenga la ciencia debe preponderar pues, y hay que destinarle recursos a esto ya sea a los locales o, o a nivel de, de, de ayudas extranjeras pues. Thank you, I was just gonna, I'm gonna do a quick summary of what uh, Douglas just said, it's basically saying that the condition of many biological uh, collections including Uh, herbariums, fish collections, and others are in critical situation, and it has been really hard to keep track, to keep uh, this collection working properly, and we uh, are hoping that uh, in the future, in the near future, we can um, uh, improve the situation by, uh, by increasing the funds and, 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 and the support. I have one other question here. This is either for Elogio or, or Cristabel. Mm -hmm. Uh, your results suggest a growing trend of reorganization of the plant communities with maybe more diverse species traits, species and life forms. Is it going to any particular direction that you think is, is going, uh, these changes are going? Um, we, we have to look in deep what are the species and the community. And we are waiting for uh, another result from other colleagues to see what is the species and what is the, 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 the direction of these chains. Uh, this is a, it, it's a starting like a, a monitoring what is the change because we see that uh, in South America, specifically in the mountain, in the Andes mountain, there is not uh records about uh the impact of global change or global warming in this case about uh forest displacement like in alpes or in uh, in european mountains and we see the the same patterns more or less um a little bit slowly than the uh, highest um uh, warming uh in into the the climate Uh, mountain. Thank you. I have I have a message here that we have basically need to wrap up the meeting. Um, we can keep uh, following any other major question, please. For those that attendees that had question and want to reach out to any of us, we can uh, can be contacted using the WOVA platform. Send us a message. And really, really, really thank you very much to the ATVC and uh, the people that were able to join us uh, today. Um, we hope that this was informative enough and we can uh, move forward with continuing research and continuing this, uh, the support to our Venezuelan research community. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye. Oh, bye. Thank Gracias. you. Bye. bye, -bye.